Hey YouTube, Do It Yourself Junkie 369 here, and today is day 124 of our RV 10 build. I am going to be fixing this mountain point for the trim tab servo. And basically, in my last video, I described where I made these pieces. The drill bit shifted a little bit, and it shifted the same direction on both pieces, but then one piece gets rotated. 180 degrees making the actual shift between them offset each other making the problem worse and I only have this short piece of material left over so after a long sit in my moaning chair and I'll make a video describing what this essential aircraft building piece of equipment is I figured I'd try to come up with a solution where I didn't have to order a new piece and drill out all these rivets and I, I have enough material to make one more piece. And since I know my drill bit is going to shift on me when I'm drilling this hole that acts as the uh, this hole that is the location of the axle, and we want to make sure it's not offset and at an angle, which would cause the cam to kind of be in there crooked and everything to end up not parallel and a whole bunch of binding to occur. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the piece as it describes in the plans, drill this hole, but then not drill the eighth inch hole that matches it. And what I'm going to do is put it in there, bolt everything down up tight, and then go and drill the location hole. That way I know that there won't be any binding and that the bolt will be holding those two holes in alignment and the eighth inch hole that I drive to match the bracket here will be in a location that allows everything to line up. That way I don't have to worry about getting that hole precise as it states in the plans. Uh, if I had a drill press it wouldn't be such a big deal. You clamp the piece, you drill, drill bit's not going to wander that much. But since I was drilling by hand, even though I center punched and then drilled, I still had the drill bit cut uneven and walk on me for some reason. I think maybe my quarter inch is uh, defective because it happened exactly the same more than once. And it didn't seem to cut so well when I used it back on installation of the static ports. Anyway, that's my plan. Still working on the empennage attach kit or section. Uh, once I get this thing installed, we'll pretty much be finished with that section. My uh, rod end bearing for the control tubes on the way, so I'll get to finish that up later, probably in this video. As always, gotta get to work. So even with pre-drilling the hole, it walked off to the right. And looking at the drill bit, it looks like there might be damage to the cutting surface. So probably need to throw that one in the trash and buy a new one. But I suspect that not drilling that eighth inch hole Instead, mounting or mount 
mounting this basically using the bolt to hold it in place and then drilling match drilling holes might be a better way to go I just need to figure out which one I want to get rid of Okay, while I'm waiting for the primer to dry, I'm going to go ahead and skip to step three. Um, part of that is drilling this out to number 28 bit. I was a little bit worried about that. So I, one of the things I read in the manual is it says you can in fact drill this out. You just have to be careful. And that whole body is like reinforced fiberglass plastic type stuff, so it should be okay. I just have to be careful. I'm guessing the biggest thing is don't twist the bit sideways and torque on that flange while the bit's going through the hole, otherwise you would probably crack it. And then, even though it shouldn't matter, I'm going to go ahead and deburr these. I looked everywhere for the washers that I was supposed to use. Here on step three, they're AN960-4Ls, and I couldn't find them in any of the hardware bags. So the only thing that I can assume is you're supposed to use the ones out of the hardware kit that comes with your tr trim servo. It looks like, however, you wouldn't want to use the clevis pins that come with that kit because they would be too long. They're, they're built for the plastic uh, clevises that are included in the kit that are supposed to be screwed onto the piece of threaded rod, which you're not using that as well. So the two little jam nuts, the clevis pins are too big. You probably could get away with using the cotter pins that accompany the kit. But really they're not needed since those are in a hardware bag. But my
my rule of thumb is don't throw it out because who knows if I need it later. And if you look really carefully and pay close attention, the plans show you exactly how to bend the cutter pin. So in this case, we're kind of splitting the cutter pin open. But if you look at the previous step on the installing that bolt and nut combo, instead of the cutter pin splitting and curling over this way, across the axis of the nut bolt, it is going along the axis of the bolt. And I'll show you close-up pictures of how they differ here so you can see that. And basically, that's the way I was taught to do cutter pins in the military working on aircraft. If it was a castellated nut, a lot of times it would go along the axis of the bolt and over the top of the, the protrusion of the bolt. And there was only very specific instances where it would split perpendicular to the axis of the bolt and then tuck back into castellations on the nut. Um, I don't have an example of that yet, so I'll probably talk about it later if I ever find a step where that would be applicable. And looking really closely at the drawings and the plans, you can just barely make out that's how they're having you do this. So I usually grab, um, in this case I'll have to hold it with something to keep it from spinning. I can't find, there it is. But main thing is while I'm opening that cotter pin up, I'm going to pull it really tightly. And what I'm trying to do is to get this thing to be installed as tight as possible so that it cannot slip around and get hung up on something and, and basically possibly like unbend bend itself back straight somehow and end up falling out. So we're just going back to repairing this piece and then I'll go back and pick up step two. This time around I want to make sure to install the right rivets the first time and to have the manufacturer head and the shop head on the correct Size, as indicated in the drawing. This is one time where I've actually seen them indicate rivets. And it follows the convention of put the shop head on the, or sorry, put the manufacturer's head on the thinner metal, which is a convention that I normally follow. Except for somehow I managed to get it wrong this time. So it figures the, the one time I, I deviate from what I normally do and it happens to be wrong. So that's okay. I had to drill out the rivets because they were the wrong size anyway. I just need to avoid. And then I had to drill out for this repair. So I just need to make sure I don't have to drill out a third time. Okay, <clears throat> now that that repair is complete, we can continue back to step two, installing this. And basically you want this upside down, 
this to go in with the little hole and the big hole towards the bottom and the back or your left side. Um, basically the side with three holes on it faces to the small end of this bracket and the corner with the one hole out here by itself faces to the open big end and then washer stack up exactly how it shows in the manual. And on this it's definitely easier to hold it so the bolt's facing down, or the bolt head is facing down. Place one washer on it. And then kind of slide everything together. And then the tricky part of adding your last washer which just isn't nearly as hard as getting the elevators on. And to me, this is the most difficult part about working on the aircraft is getting the washers in between stuff because it's so easy to like just drop it and it just drops all the way through and not end up on the bolt like you need it. And it's kind of an art, you have to work at it. Um, like for the one on the elevator, I ended up using like two really small flathead screwdrivers and a scribe lining up everything without dropping it down into the tail cone. And it took quite a few tries, as you probably saw in the video, that I was standing there forever. Um, and high speed, it, it looks like a very short time, but I swear putting that one bolt and washer stack up in both elevator horns uh, probably took me half an hour to do an hour. That's just how stuff goes. And this is one area where I'm not sure I should torque this down or not because torquing will put pressure on everything and possibly cause it to not rotate freely but definitely freely rotating assembly now unlike before I had to really push on it to get to, to rotate yeah the more I tighten it down just finger tight for me the uh, stiffer and stiffer that gets so like right now it won't move at all and there's no way I hit the torque that that nut would need to be at so I'll just back it off castellation until it's loose and install yeah. and now an easy way that I do these cotter pins that get split open along the bolt shaft is I put the long side facing out away from the bolt head and I put the short side facing the bolt head. That way I s grab that long end and bend it over the end of the bolt first then I easily push the short end up along the nut. And just in case you need to see it again here is that picture of this particular setup. And this is one that's real key where I grab that long tip, long, longer leg of the cover pin and I really pull on it as I spin that around and then I make sure that leg bends over the top of that bolt 
or the end of that bolt nice and flat so that it can't twist to either side and then take that shorter leg and just push it next to the bolt nice and tight that way when you put a finger on it you shouldn't be able to rotate that cotter pin back and forth it should basically be solid feeling almost like there's no play in it it takes that's another thing that just takes practice but nice thing about all that is now we get to check off that step and continue on building since I finally got that mistake fixed and it was a lot better than I thought I thought I was going to have to drill off both those pieces and build them from scratch which took a lot of work quite honestly making them with a handsaw and some time sitting and thinking about it and watching TV rather than out here working and making stuff worse this solution became apparent really easy to do And these screws are small enough that I don't know if you'll find the torque in any aircraft manual. Just be, con just be aware that it's going to be under 28 inch pounds. And uh, I couldn't even get a wrench in there really. I was just using the 516s to kind of like wedge it in place. So I'm not even sure how you would torque those. So just tighten them down, but don't go too tight. Um, basically, if you strip out the head of the screw, you went too far. These appear to be identical at either end, so just choose an end and install it for the next step is what it seems. I believe for me, I left one of them down there on the other end of the tail cone because I was planning on storing them in there temporarily. And then I only put one in there. Not quite sure what I was thinking. And there's a lock washer that came on here, but no lock washer in the design or the plan drawing. So my thought on that is not to use it. I guess worst case scenario is I'd have to come back and install it later.
Okay, I need to go find a battery so I can run this to the retract position. Right now it seems somewhere in the middle. And you do that by connecting to the gray and the white wire with a 9 volt battery. Uh, you can wire up the rock, rocker switch and everything like that, but I, I'm missing about half an aircraft. And the switch would be up there somewhere on the control panel or on my stick, which I haven't bought yet. So, in the meantime, I'm going to use a 9 volt battery to test. Um, you could get away with using 12 volts, but why bother? And when you get to testing your position lights, like for the light I'm buying, if you stick a 12 volt battery supply on it, it'll uh, damage the light and then you're out 100 bucks. <coughs> Alright, I have my tw trusty 9 volt here. I just need to strip off a little bit of insulation and give this a shot. Hopefully no magic smoke comes out. The uh, big thing on this is make sure you don't connect any power source to the blue, green, or orange wire. That's a big no-no. And this has highlighted my need to get some real wire strippers that are built for this kind of work. We'll try gray to negative and white to positive first and see which way that moves. That happened to move it the correct direction. That's uh, pretty useful. So gray negative, white positive moves it to the retract position and this will automatically stop when it gets to the end of its travel in either direction. So that, that's a good safety feature to know. And that was able to make it to the end of its travel still has a little bit left that it can move. Let's move it the other direction and see if there's any sort of interference. And no interference there. So it seems like it did a fairly good job. of accidentally putting this together right. Uh, I screwed the rod end bearings in 10 rotations, full rotations, because I was worried about not having enough thread engagement. Um, I'm sure later I will fine tune this a little bit more than what it is. So for now, that seems like it works. I think for this next part, to make it easier, I'm going to need this vertical stabilizer off of the bird, off of the tail cone, and to do that, I'm going to need somebody with small arms, probably. But I have to be able to get my hand in here to 
to help me feed it through this hole and grommet or bushing in the F spar of the horizontal stabilizer and there's not really any gap to do that with this vertical stabilizer on. And we're almost to the point where it's all got to come off anyway, so I might as well do it. Phew, that was a bit of a pain in the butt. Not looking forward to doing that a second time when we do the final install. I guess on the scale of things, it's not the worst thing I've had to do. As far as I can tell, you have to feed those cables in that way. So while I could take the vertical stable or horizontal stabilizer off and remove it fairly easy, installing somebody would have to hold and move forward with the horizontal stabilizer while somebody else was routing the cables through as you move forward. So it'd be a pain in the butt. So it's just easier that when I disassemble it, I take the uh, it apart exactly the same way it went together. Well, that's an interesting problem. I'm supposed to screw these E616PP cover plates to the elevator trim cable, which is sticking out there, but because the cover plate is so wide, I don't have the clearance needed to do what they're asking. And the cape, there's not enough play in the cable, it seems, to get there. So I'm wondering if the 
do this if I need to connect, disconnect the other end and pull it this way some to get enough slack to do that. And then pull it all back. Because right now there's no way to rotate that cover plate to screw the whole thing on there. I could drill out the blind rivets, screw the nut on there, and then rivet it to the cover plate. That might be the easiest way to do it. I'm going to go look online and see what other people have done and try to figure this one out. Okay, uh, I, I talked about it in my two year update video, but I have the wing kit is finally here. I need to break it open and start inspecting it, but also really need some room. I was planning on having this horizontal stabilizer and these elevators back up on the wall, out of the way, before the wind kit arrived and stuff happened and now I'm behind. So basically I'm going to finish up the elevator rigging, finish up the uh, control tube that I need the rod end bearing for and get this thing broken apart and stowed away so that I can start work on the wings. And during that time, there's a lot of other stuff going on, as normal. Uh, I need to get rid of this ginormous 5,000 pound mill I have sitting over here. Uh, basically, it needs to be put back together, restored. And I've talked to some people who specialize in that, and they said it's not worth it. Uh, they, they weren't even interested in having it to work on for themselves. So that needs to go away and create space. Uh, there's my car, the Audi, uh, has a coolant leak that has continually gotten worse, so I need to do that. Uh, the Xterra, the I'm driving it now, but in the previous weeks I've been changing out the thermostat and the timing belt. There, the timing belt just was a mileage issue. Um, it had broken once before, so this is my third timing belt in the vehicle, and I wanted to make sure to get it changed at the appropriate mileage before it broke. And then the thermostat had just uh, stuck partially opening or open or opening too early or something, but the engine wasn't heating up and it was causing a whole bunch of issues due to that. So that's fixed, luckily. And with gas prices, I need to get my motorcycle back on the road as well. So there's a lot of other stuff going on. So I'm going to try to get that done and then inventory the crates. And then I might be taking a little bit of a break to get some work done. Uh, hopefully not as big as a break as the last one. Anyway, I, I gotta get to work, nothing else to it. Okay, I found the bag. Um, I did make a video that will go in my playlist back before this step occurred. So hopefully you can avoid drilling out the rivets. Because these are a rivet that I have run short on, and I bought extra. So hopefully I brought, hopefully when I purchase this, usually I get a little bit extra over what I have left to need. And hopefully I, I bought at least eight extra, and I don't have to purchase more of them. And there's more than eight in this bag, but I'm sure they're used somewhere else in this build process that I felt the need to pick up more than what was required. So I guess that only leaves one thing to do which is to drill out those rivets and continue on with the build process.
Okay, so in step three, you have to attach these cover plates to the elevators. The hardware is not called out in section nine or section 10, uh, especially section 10, I'm surprised it's not there. Those nut plates are 632 thread, and there's a bag 1135 and a bag 1134, both that have 6-32 screws in them. I had to look up the spec on the screw. They, although, they, it wasn't very clear. Like, the bag 1134, it's very clear that these are 632s based on how screws are nomenclature. Uh, 1135, it wasn't so clear, but I'm guessing that I need to use bag 1135 because it has stainless steel fasteners in it. And to me, since they're going outside in the elements, it makes sense to use stainless steel. Despite stuff like the clevis pens and everything else not looking stainless steel. Hopefully I'm not wrong on this. I do plan to include this in my email to Vans concerning the when to rivet the trim cable brackets to the cover plates and yeah, making a suggestion there and I'll just kind of go like, hey, uh, this wasn't anywhere in the manual and hopefully I've done it correctly. But as part of setting this up, you do have to attach those. And I probably should have stopped the build clock, went in there and researched it. But I thought it was going to take me a little less time to do it. Okay, so I have these on here. Um, I'm about five degrees short on this one, and this one is even shorter than that, almost a full 10 degrees off of what it says in the manual. I know there is a lot of write-ups on adjusting this correctly. And I'm going to go read those and try to figure out what I've done wrong and what I need to be doing differently. I think one thing that is open for adjustment, because in the manual it just says adjust the clevises until you get the deflection you need. Well, I have my clevises and jam nuts screwed all the way in. There's no more thread left. So I'm wondering if I adjusted up here incorrectly and those clevises need to be screwed in basically effectively shorting, shortening the, the cable and causing it to retract just that little bit more might give me that 
or the mounting plate, I wonder if it needs to be turned in one more revolution to kind of move everything forward just that little bit more. Uh, right now, it, it said to center that on the threaded portion, and I have eight threads on one side and nine threads on the other, is basically what it is. And so, uh, actually, I, I got that backwards. The, the nut or the bracket would have to be spun out one time, and, and that would shorten it. And that would put eight threads on the back end here and nine threads on the front end here. And so that's, that's one area where I feel like I could adjust it. And basically I'll fiddle with that. Or once I read, go over and do my research, I'll come back and I'll fiddle with that until I get it exactly what I needed. And I'll try to tell you like if I deviate from the manual somewhere. That way it's at least some benefit for you to watch. <clears throat> okay, so I did some research. Um, the alternate method of adjusting these is, was figured out by a guy named Bill. I will not butcher his last name. Um, I'll put it at the bottom of the screen. Anyway, Bill uh, drew some triangles, did a lot of trig, figured out instead of using the 35 degree method, he would set this at 3 inches. It said vertical. Uh, I'm wondering if it's straight line from tip to tip. Because that's really close to three inches now, and I know I was only about five degrees off. If I go vertical, I'm almost a half inch short, which seems excessive. So, uh, where'd my ruler go? Oh, anyway, the difference is measuring straight down versus at the slight angle from tip to tip. And as I said before here, I'm at about two and a quarter, three quarter. And this way I'm only vertical, I'm only at about uh, two and a quarter. Um, so, I really need to adjust this, and I think first area I'm going to adjust it is here on the cable mounts, because if I screw that out one turn, it'll switch the threads, because it's not really halfway. There's eight threads on one side, nine threads on the other, and if I switch it for nine threads being on the back, or on, on this side, that will pull the whole cable assembly inboard a little bit and cause this to retract further. And then I'm not entirely sure I got the attachment points set up correctly when I did step one. And I was a little bit skeptical when I did it, but I don't think one or the other by itself will give me the adjustment that I'm short. So I'm thinking I need both. Anyway, uh, his method is you get three inches there, you run this up level, and then you set this side to trail, to match. Because the point where this comes up level, this should have stopped moving. Um, Right now, with my current adjustment, this one's adjusted too high, and so as it comes up, this one actually goes above the elevator, while this one is still below it, and that's bad. Don't want that. And that's what his method is supposed to eliminate, and then with the 3-inch measurement versus 35 degrees, it's supposed to be a more accurate way for people to adjust their trim tabs. On mine, I, I have that uh, angle finder. It's pretty easy to use, pretty nice. And I feel like that might be a more accurate way for me. But I still, I'm going to try the book way. I'm going to try to get 35, which I think my error in adjustment is up here on the cam, the clevis that goes to the cam. So I need to adjust that. And then I will adjust the plates. And 
check the movement to see if this one stops in trail position and doesn't go above. You don't want it to really go above. You definitely don't want them to split one above, one below. So I'll try the book method and if that doesn't work, I'll do this side and then adjust this side to match basically. So it appears I need about three degrees and I suspect I'll be able to get that. Okay, so I took those off, checked them, turned out they were in a really good spot, so I ended up not moving them. So all my adjustments are going to be, have to, going to be up here on this clevis where it attaches to the cam. And on that, I'm going to be screwing the clevises in. I feel like when I put it together, I just didn't get those adjusted properly in that first step. And unfortunately, now it's going to be a pain to work on because it's inside the airplane and I don't feel like disassembling all of that. Right there I was double checking the cam making sure I had that screw or in the uh, tail up position or nose up position 32.2 so almost there Okay, so two revolutions of that clevis up front, or not, it's not a clevis, it's a bearing, uh, increased this gap by almost a degree and a quarter. So I'm now at 33 and a half, which is within the range. The max travel is 35, the minimum is 32. So I'm actually good there. And then the other side is 35 and 32. But then for the up travel, it has to be zero uh, for both the max and the min. It's not allowed to deviate from zero, basically. So if I take it apart, and make 
two turns and a half, that should get me really close to where I need to be. And if I'm off a little bit, as long as I don't run out of cable travel, I can adjust back here. Okay, so I had um, Astrophysicist 21, I believe. I'll put channels links here so you can go check out their pages. But him and USPSA Spidey came over to help me work on the airplane. We got it after about an hour and 10 minutes. Basically, it was get this one at 35 degrees down and then open up this cable and adjust 
where it screws into the cover plate and the brace here and actually slide the cable shell forward to allow this one to move far enough down because the interior part of the cable was hitting the exterior part of the cable and so we had to shift the exterior part of the cable several threads despite following the directions exactly. Otherwise, this side wouldn't go down far enough. And then from there, once it was down fully, it naturally lined up with the edge here at level. And so, when they take off moving, the one on the right moves faster than the one on the left. But eventually, with how the cam works, the one on the left, through the max of its throw, starts catching up. And so right there, if you measure from this tip down to here and that tip down to there, they are both the same distance. And using our angle finder, it's roughly 35 degrees. And some of this required adjustment of the clevises up front. And like I said, I followed the directions exactly, getting everything in the middle. Well, this had to shift the whole cable housing forward because actually looking at the brace, it kind of makes sense. It's a little bit further back. And part of that might be maybe I didn't get the braces in the exact correct position, but I could have swore those holes were punched and then match drilled. But slight variation of building. And then on the way up, as they come up to the level position or the trail position, the one on the left will stop. So right there, the one on the left has stopped. And the one on the right continues up. That's what it's supposed to look like. And in the up position, it's supposed to move up between 23 and 25 degrees. It's closer to 23 in this position, which is totally acceptable. And the down, both of them are supposed to go anywhere from 32 to 35. Um, on my plane, if I didn't get them all the way down to 35, they wouldn't stop in the trail position like they're supposed to on the left elevator. And then the other thing I ran into is with the angle finder, it's quite hard, or the, with the angle digital level, it's quite hard to determine that exact angle. Uh, there seems to be some variation in like how the skin shaped and that causes different angle readings. So on that side, I think using the three inches from trail to uh, top of the trim tab is probably the way to go. But now that that's done, I can go back to setting up my control tube and then get this off the plane and start breaking into these wing boxes. And quite honestly, I, I planned on showing exactly what I did. And it, it's quite hard. And I'll probably maybe like use some picture captures out of the manual and discuss what I did exactly in another video. But basically, it was get both of these to match in the down position run them up until the right one is level and check if the left one's level and then adjust accordingly and most of my trouble was getting this side to run down to match the right side because the external sleeve of the cable was stopping the internal portion from moving far enough forward and so i had to shift the outside of the cable sleeve forward by adjusting the hard mount points Basically, instead of it being screwed halfway, it is almost all the way forward in this front bracket and almost all the way out on this aft bracket that's mounted to the cover plate. And I'll go over that in a separate video using pictures and a mouse 
showing exactly how it's set up. But the important part is it's set up and when I go to remove this I'm keeping everything in one piece. I'll basically lift the horizontal stabilizer, slide it forward so that the trim tab bracket will clear the rest of the plane body, pull that up so it aligns with the hole and slide everything back and off the plane and mount everything on the wall in one assembly which will cause me to adjust how my stuff is set up on the wall so I have enough clearance but no issue there. Let's get back to step four on page six of section 11 here which is installing these rod end bearings and I had messed one up so I had to order another one and so that's what I'll be doing finally and I have my new rod end bearing right here it's been so long that I'll have to reread the instructions to get it right And one thing I just noticed on this is the forward end gets set at an inch and a half and the aft end gets set at an inch and three thirty seconds. So make sure you pay attention to that. I really need to clean up my garage. It has come somewhat of a disaster, but I finally found the Sharpie, so we'll mark aft here. And forward, FWD up here. tight on the jam nuts because we're about to make an adjustment and now it is time to install it in the plane with the hardware shown which tracking down all this hardware is always lots of fun for those of you that don't under sar understand sarcasm that was it One thing that I've determined when I start inventorying these next two crates that I'm sitting on top of, I'm going to go down and mark what the hardware is on each one of these plastic bags so I don't have to reference the list every time because that is frustrating. On my particular installation, I used two thick washers on either side of this rod and bearing on this thing. Uh, you can use up to two per each side of the thick ones and one thin one. I didn't have to use the thin one, but because of variations in building, that's how you might have variations of washer stack ups. And then, of course, a thick or a thin one on the outside, depending on how much grip length you need on your nut and your bolt. I got away with the shorter dash 12 bolt instead of the dash 13 and I'm able to use a thick washer. 
and I'm going to have more than enough threads going through that nut. But just finger tight for now because we need to adjust that rod end bearing to get this tuned to the exact length. And that is step six, or not step six. Uh, basically, the steps on the ne very next page, page seven. Actually, what we have to do now is check elevator travel. travel. The main thing I'm worried about is making sure that the service bulletin that came out concerning the elevator stops for the horns here is not going to be an issue. Which it's not. Um, there, there's enough overlap that where I would never end up with the flat part of the horn coming up against the stop and getting stuck there. Um, and I'll show a picture of an example of what I'm talking about. And basically in this example, this is not what's occurring on my. So no issue there. Probably don't need the service bulletin or to worry about it. As far as the elevators, they have to go maximum up down 30 and 25 and a minimum of 20 and 25. So 25 to 30 up and 20 to 25 down. And I think that is not going to be an issue. We'll set it in trail. Zero it out. We have 25 down. and 29.1 up. So very solid, no issues there. So we've confirmed what we need to on step six and we're able to continue on to the next page, making some real progress today. Now step one is to secure the elevator balance back in place with its strip of duct tape. Um, I don't remember what video it is, I'll probably link it here, where I decided to use pieces of wood with safety wire. Much better system because I put one of those in and I'm done. And it's removable, you just slide it in and out. And when I stick those up on the wall, that's going to hold everything in position. I also, I have some small ones from the, for the elevator trim, but now that the trim motor's hooked up, that's so much of an issue. Those aren't moving around by themselves anymore. And then I need to transfer the template shown in figure one on page 11-7 to a piece of cardboard or a piece of plywood. And instead of messing up my plans, I have the electronic version, so I can just print out that page. Or you can photocopy it, whichever one you'd find easiest. So. I'm going to go do that now. Okay, so step two here that is to transfer the template shown in figure one to a stiff piece of cardboard or wood to avoid cutting up your plans. Center punch the paper at three corners and then trace from your center punches. Uh, it's a lot easier than that, especially if you have a copier or printer, an electronic version of the plans or just your plans period with a copier. I took uh, the electronic version, printed them out on a A4 or a 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper, which is a bit undersized to the normal plans, and then went and printed it out on 198% uh, magnification for the or enlargement for the uh, copier, which is bigger than what's actually in the plans, but I figured nice big piece to use would be good. Taped it to this piece of cardboard and then now I'm just going to cut down the lines to get my template. And I feel like 
with a 91.4 degree angle cutting along the lines creating my template might be a hair more accurate than trying to basically stick a needle through marking three holes and then tracing those holes and there's our cardboard template to go and adjust the rotting bearings so we get the appropriate angle on the bell crank placement and really for this I'm going to loosen the jam nuts on both ends that way I can either screw them out or in at the same time and basically it should be set up to where they're both right hand thread and they're opposite So, let me think about this. If I rotate the tube, it's tightening in. The other direction will be loosening. That's correct, yes. Yeah, so the way these are set up is you probably actually have to disconnect and loosen or tighten. Yep, so I'm, I'm thinking correctly. If I just grab the tube and spun it one direction, it'll tighten one rod end bearing in, but loosen the other rod end bearing. And that's not what we want. We either want to lengthen or shorten, so we'll actually have to disconnect the rod end bearings to make an adjustment. Um, it does not specify which end to make the adjustment on, but the aft end is 1 32nd farther out than the forward end. And since that's the easier end to make the adjustment on, I'm guessing if you've got to lengthen it, it's done there. If you've got to shorten it, you could really use either end. But probably mostly it will be done at the forward end of the aircraft where it's easy to adjust the rod end bearings compared to back here where it is a little bit more difficult. Really, if I wanted to adjust the one in the back, I'd probably disconnect the tube from the front end bell crane and spin the whole tube, depending on whether I need to shorten or lengthen that connection. Okay, that was pretty easy. I had to go out a couple turns on the front. It was going to require four, so I went ahead and did two turns on the back as well, just to even things out. The last step is to tighten those jam nuts. And when doing this, the key is not to let the rod end bearing twist sideways. And when I take this out, before I take this out, I'll check that angle again and then probably uh, take it out and then lock, or not lock tight, but torque stripe that jam nut just so I can see if it ever breaks loose and rotates. Um, this is one area where it seems like people would really like to see this safety wired just so that if it is uh, breaks loose even though it shouldn't possibly be able to spin all the way because one will tighten before the other is loosened but just in case um, it, it's something to consider Okay, so I removed the push truck and stored it inside the tail cone. Now it's time to start removing the horizontal stabilizer, elevator, and 
trim tab assembly with the trim motors the way I described earlier and you'll see it on here and then put it up on the wall and I'm done with this section and ready to push ahead over into the wing kits and I'll finish up the rest of the tail cone section when I have a spare moment and basically from there it's putting on fiberglass fairings is what it moves into and when I do that I'll also be putting in the strobe light in the tail which I haven't ordered yet. Um, I'm 100% sure I'm going with Fly LEDs in their kit, um, which I plan on buying as I do the wind kit because I'm going to need to do that install and build, which will be pretty interesting to do. Okay, so since the last part of the video, you probably noticed a huge change. No more horizontal stabilizer and uh, elevators. That complete assembly is up on the wall. Um, my plan was to unscrew the bracket that holds the trim tab and basically slide everything forward and then remove that. That's not possible. Um, what I had to do was disconnect the clevises at the back where they attach to the trim tabs allowing the cables to slide forward slightly you don't want to remove them all the way and that would allow the trim tab bracket to clear and come back up through this hole and then we just picked up the whole assembly and stuck it up on the wall there's a nice picture of it I'm going to show you right now and that's where it'll be living probably for the next couple of years maybe even three I'm hoping to start moving faster on this. Uh, a lot of thanks to uh, USPSA Spider-Man, his channel's here, and Astrophysicist21, his channel's here. And now USPSA Spider-Man, he does a lot of USPSA matches and has a couple of YouTube videos about shooting and is actually starting or has started a company where he's going to train you how to train for that type of event. Uh, and basically, he, he is really fast becoming, well, already the best shooter I know, and then becoming uh, up on a national stage even. Uh, the other guy, Astrophysicist, his channel, I think he has a couple videos of iRacing. He's really good at iRacing. Uh, he is also into a Kerbal Space Program, something that he's been, two things he's been trying to convince me to get into. And so there's videos of that. I um, actually don't know what else he has on there. He's inside talking to a buddy on the phone. Otherwise, I'd have him tell you about his channel. Um, but I'm going to end this video since we finished section 11. Section 12 would be putting the fiberglass pieces on the aircraft. And I figured I can work on that a little bit at a time if I have some downtime where I'm waiting on something that on the wings that requires two people and that I need to wait for help. I can have something to work on. So I'm not going to mess with that right now. I'm going to go ahead and start in the next video breaking open the crates and going through the whole process of verifying everything that's there. Um, I have a couple of things I've learned from my tail kit that I'm going to utilize and one of it is taking the bags of fasteners and writing on them what the fastener is. That way I don't have to cross reference back to the packing list every time I want to know what I'm holding in my hand. And I know I got the idea basically I had to buy some spare fasteners and when Van strips them out it's written on the bag in Sharpie. It doesn't last for a very long time if you leave it out sitting around the shop, but if I put them in these brown note card holders that I have, it should uh, fare well and not wear off. And if it does wear off, I still have the backup bag number that I can go and look up. So, really excited to be moving forward. So, that will be in the very next video. 
which I plan on starting as soon as I end this one. Anyway, as normal, or as usual, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Um, there's a, a strap hanging down from hanging the kayak. Uh, hopefully, but got distracted there. Hopefully you enjoyed the video, enjoyed watching it. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Think about maybe sharing a couple videos or like tagging a certain timestamp if you want to share that with somebody. That would really help out. Uh, think about subscribing if you haven't already. And as normal, if you want, my build log is down in the description. It's the link that's uh, put up on my Google Drive so you're able to go there. You can download it. Uh, you can uh, take it and play with it and use it as your own. I don't care. It's not something that took me a lot of time to create, but I find it very useful in a good way. And I'll, like I said in an earlier video, I will create a video where I'll show like how to link in photos for your build log and basically make it your own. And then also go over a couple little tricks that I used in Excel to kind of like do some stuff like predict my uh, projected end date, which right now does not look good. It's saying 2033. That's unacceptable. But it's based on my average work time. And then it's predicting using that work time how long it's going to take me. Um, so it's my own fault. I need to crack down and get working. But stuff has happened, obviously. And then also in the description is my builder number. If you're ordering a Vans aircraft and you liked my videos and you found anything I did helpful at all and feel like I deserve a pat on the back or some form of thanks, please use my builder's number to, uh, with your order. They'll send you a form of like giving a referral and that person that you've referred or basically referred you or however you want to view it gets a hundred bucks from Vans and it costs nothing extra out of your pocket and it would be really awesome I could use that to pay for my fuselage kit uh, or at least soften the blow of the, the price tag that comes with that. Thanks for watching and hopefully you continue watching and subscribe. See you later.